writing this down. Two. Pressures facing growers to adopt unsustainable farming methods, organic biodynamics, permaculture, natural system organics, and the top 10 list. I'll we'll give that to you. I may actually go over by about three minutes, so just bear with me. Are you going to go on do this? Yeah, sure. sure. Pressure cooker. So I was made, told to do this. I'm the executive director for the Hallmark Growers Association. Um, next, uh, by the way, Save the Farmer, Save the Land. Uh, you guys are actually standing on or sitting on uh, one of only three Class A, Class 1 lands in all of North America. And you paved over it. Congratulations. Next. Class 1, by the way, is where you can go every day. This is the world in the rail. This is the Holland March. Next. Nature's second to none. We have everything. I've had to deal with wolves, endangered species. I've had to deal with, uh, in no particular order, a cougar, which the Minister of Natural Resources denied was a cougar, except the fact that they had scat for it, which meant that there was a problem, because according to the Ministry of Natural Resources, cougars do not exist in Ontario. They have it for the last 28 years. So the cougar that was on the property that I had to deal with was a myth. <laughs> Humans interact with it. We are to marsh. 12,000 acres of land. I can tell you right now that if we were to propose what we did 100 years ago, it would never be allowed by the government because of all the rules and regs that we'll have to deal with later on. And Rod and I can talk about that. Next. Freshness is growing. Rod and I will agree on this. We are the solution to all the healthcare problems that exist. Four of the top five diseases faced by North Americans are food related. No particular order, you can do obesity, heart, cancers. All those are food-related diseases that have impacted upon us. Next. Health spread from each field. The marsh grows 61 different crops. No, 62. No, 63 this year. I have more growing. When I started, there was 47 crops. These are not varieties. We grow 27 varieties of onions. We grow 34 varieties of carrots. We grow 20 two different varieties of tomatoes. We grow 17 varieties of sprouts. They're not varieties, we grow crops. Next. So what pressures could create problems for this area known as the Hall Marsh? We're going to talk about it. This, by the way, is the marsh. This is not a row crop. I'm going to be the one that's, how should I say this, offensive to most of you, so just bear with me. Next. Top 10 reasons. And I was told to do a top 10 list, so we'll do the Paul Schaefer. Why you won't see farming the way that you want to see it. Number 10 is defining farming practices from the farmer's point of view. This is a nice little collage that we've done up. That's the city of Toronto in the background. The reason why you will not see farming from farming practices as you see it is because two things. First, define it for the farmer. Farmers are environmental stewards of the land. They do the very best thing because they actually play, work, and live on the land that they do. They have to. That is their occupation, that's their job. But in addition, that's their playground. They're always there. So they're not gonna sit there and poison anything that they have to get money off of. And they're not gonna do it because they all have families. So that's a difficult perspective to understand from a farmer thing. So that's the one thing that you need to know. By the way, Rod will agree with me on this, defining agriculture, define farming. I deal with 14 definitions of farming. We'll get to that. Next. Number nine, consumer expectations. God love you. In Ontario, we grow, raise, harvest, um, procure over 230 different crops and livestock. Notice the words I'm using. Our biggest issue in agriculture is definitions. We define it. Rod used a word that's really offensive to me. The word is commodity. Commodity is oil, gold, silver. That's a commodity. We grow food. There's a difference with what we do. And the whole point beyond it is that we have diversity coming out of the yin yang in Ontario. If I put you into the marsh, I can put you onto a spot in the marsh where everything that we do within this province, I can find within 100 miles. If that's your definition of local. Local to me is Ontario because we are a big province. So therefore, that's where I'm going to get off. We have different things. Consumers expect different things. You expect different things because your definitions of what you eat are completely your own. 
If I was to tell you this, you'd laugh, but there are four definitions, four functional definitions of local. Government regulated. Federal government has one. Under CFIA, which is the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which is the former agency that we had to deal with, they define local as 35 miles. Anything within 35 miles is defined as local. Foodland Ontario is part of the government for the province of Ontario. Foodland Ontario well, has two definitions. One is all of Ontario. Obviously, they have to do it from Thunder Bay to Ottawa all the way down to Windsor and all points in between. Their second one is 100 kilometers, because somehow that got into the mix of what we need to deal with. The 100 kilometers, by the way, did not work out well for Hamilton. Hamilton got its butt kicked because 100 kilometers put a farmer out of Peterborough, but put three farmers in from Ohio. That's 100 kilometers. So consumer expectations, I just said three of the definitions. The only consumer expectation, the only definition that I care about is the consumers. They define what they want for local, whether it be within 100 miles, whether it be in their backyard, whether it be the province, whether it be the country, whether it be just North America. That is the only definition that should really matter. You shouldn't regulate nor govern what the definition of local is because that puts impediments in front of the farmers. So that's a pressure. Next. Number eight, farmers themselves. These are my guys. Don't let anybody tell you different. Farmers, the average age is 58. We are the oldest sector in all of Canada. Oldest. You guys are all pups. <laughs> These guys do it because they like doing it. This is both a living and a lifestyle choice. They don't like dealing with people. They are 1.3 to 1.4% of the population in Canada. 70 years ago, they were a whole whopping 38%. 100 years ago, it was 60 percent. 100 years ago. No. Yeah, that's right. 20, 1912, right? 1912? Yeah, okay, good. So we were more than 60 percent. The farmers themselves are their own biggest challenge. Because once you hit a certain age, these guys I deal with all the time. This is the force. That's dad. That's junior. That's really junior. Junior wanted to take over. Junior is also a race car driver because he needs a second income. Because he does make enough money on the farm to be able to do it. Dad, in an answer to Rod's thing, hasn't yet figured out how to give the farm over to his son because there are tax implications for a million dollar operation that he can't deal with. Grandpa got caught in the tax implications that cost him $373,000 and his house simply because he tried to make the farm to him. Dougie here, Doug got the farm because his father died. I liked Adrian, but poof, thank God he died because that left him with an issue he didn't have to deal with. That's sad when you have to talk about that because his son is 14 and really wants the farm and he does everything. And the 14 year old is gonna have problems simply because of the barrier in front of him, which is a taxation issue. So the farmers themselves are also problematic. Being 58, they're set in their ways. The older guys that I've dealt with, this is their line. The line is this. My grandfather did it on 40 acres. My father did it on 40 acres. I should be able to make a living on 40 acres. Some 91% of these farmers have second off-farm incomes, whether it be their wife, who's usually a teacher, nurse, or something, or they themselves have second off-farm incomes. Your food is being built on that system because these guys don't consider it a hobby. They consider it a livelihood. They just can't make money off it. Next. Markets and marketing. This is why I love your group. Trontonians, and I'm just using this as a generalization, so Lauren, don't kick my butt. This is what they think is farming. They look at that and they think, oh, that's wonderful. Look at that. This is taking place. They see the cattle amongst all the dead cars out there, and they think this is cool. And that's their idea of farming. And they see the asparagus and the apples at the farmer's markets, and they think that's it. <coughs> Unlike what Rod said, because he was very polite, I'm not. The food system is broken. It's inevitably corrupt, and it's problematic, because everybody has their own vision of what's there. Food is an essential component to life. 
I don't care where you come from. I don't care how you cut it. Food, water, air, and shelter, particularly here in Canada. And my line is the line of three. Three minutes without air, generally, you die. Three days without water, generally, you die. Three weeks without food, you're dead. Three months in this country without shelter, you're pooped. These are the threes that we have to work with. But that's the reason why we can't do this, is because everybody has a different view of what farming is. If you were all to come up to the marsh, and by the way, you're all welcome to come up as a group, and I'll tour you around. This is not what you see, because this is a different image of farming. There are small farms all the way through the province. And to Lauren's comment, yes, I did do this. For 7,000 farmers I visit across Ontario and Canada and the U.S., I know these guys. I can take you to 7,000 different operations, because every farmer, this is where the markets and marketing come in, Every farmer is an independent entrepreneurial business person. It doesn't matter how you cut it. You can't lump them together. You can't group them together because they all do their own thing. They are all different. So try dealing with, in my case, 9,000 farms here in Ontario. They are all different. That's why the markets are suspect. We are globalized. We are in a monopoly situation with our retails. I'd love to be in California where they have actually 17 retailers that you can go after, but we have three. So when you want good food, when you want Ontario grown food, we have problems because that system, which is broken, is now about geared at the lowest price, regardless of where it comes from. Next. Location, location, location. This one is a pretty picture. Like that. Pretty cool. There's your monopoly on farms. Just so you know, farmers are the largest landowners in all of Ontario next to the provincial government. Farmers are. That 1.3 to 1.6 of the population own more land than anybody else in all of Ontario combined except for the government. That is about maybe six or 700 farms that you can see from the escarpment. And this, let me see if I can find it, this stretch along here no longer exists. That's industrial buildings. That's a new subdivision. That's commercial and retail operations. That's just outside of Milton, which is what the largest city going. So that's what you have to focus on. If you don't have the land, you don't have the food. If you don't have the food, guess what? You're relying on other countries that you couldn't probably identify on a map to hope that they're going to feed you. Next. Keeping up with the Joneses, this is one of my favorite things because this is reality for me. Everybody looks at that and says, oh, that's, that's really sweet, you know, 40-year-old tractor. This tractor is still worth about $40,000, $50,000. That combine up there for hay, that's only worth about $400,000. This setup, you'd like this. Who has GPS? Who drives first? I should be no, I should be making myself a new driver. Anybody drive? Nobody <laughs> drives. That's cool, you all ride bikes, so you don't have a GPS system on your bike. For those of us that actually know the province, I don't bother with GPS, I can laugh, but for somebody like Warren who gets lost just leaving the city, <laughs> she needs a GPS. GPS was around for 10 years before it got to you guys. We used it. GPS was used as a technology to help farm, to help do stuff. This is a GPS controlled tractor. You'll notice there ain't a driver in there. He's good for 11 minutes outside of the tractor without. That's a $600,000 unit all combined because these guys are planting early transplants, by the way these are onions, and there's Jason, he's wandering out, he's going to do that for 11 minutes, and on the 12th minute, the GPS system is going to go, are you there, are you still alive, and it's going to veer off and do this, and quite funny, you can actually see the roads where they've actually been out of the tractor because you have straight lines, and then it goes like this, and then it goes back over, but it asks whether you're still alive and whether it needs to call 911. So, from this, which is a 40-year-old, it's, it, it, it's beat up, but they still use this, to this, on the same crop. That's the technology that has changed. Keeping up with the Joneses means you literally have to be able to keep up with the technologies that are there. One final note on this, everybody's going food safety certification within the marsh. That's all computer technology. Please tell me what 50-year-old, let's go even better, what 58-year-old likes dealing with computers. 
they don't. I still have guys using Atari. That's the funny thing. And it's true. There's a guy that has an Atari system and that's what he uses on his computer. He doesn't understand Word, he doesn't understand Microsoft, he doesn't understand Windows, doesn't like the internet. All this stuff is geared towards having farmers your age be able to do this stuff because you grew up with the technology. They did not. So, predicting what's next. 